All right, everyone, we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us for today's Spring into Health event. My name is Haven Spanier, and I'm the Senior Director of Programming at the University of South Carolina's Alumni Association. It's my pleasure to get to introduce our host today, but before I get started, just a few reminders for you all. First, we'd like to thank Prisma Health for making today's event possible. We also want to hear your questions today. So if you have any, you can type those into the chat. If you aren't super familiar with Zoom, there's a panel across the bottom of your screen with different icons. You click that chat icon, you can type your questions into there and we will get to as many of those as we can today. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome our host today. Dr. Rick Scott received his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in Philadelphia, where he also served his internship and residency training in orthopedic surgery. Prior to joining Prisma, he was Senior VP of Clinical Operations for Advocate Aurora Health in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Scott currently serves as Chief Clinical Officer Acute Care for Prisma Health Midlands and is co-chair of the Prisma Health Vaccine Task Force. So thank you so much, Dr. Scott, for joining us today. I know we're all really interested to hear what you have to say. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Haven. Let's see if I can share this screen. Let's see, is that working? looks great. All right. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all tonight and uh, take you uh, through a little bit of a timeline where we were, where, where we are, and maybe where we're going. Um, it's uh, been quite an adventure to see uh, COVID, unfortunately, come and go so many times. Um, we'll hit a few things. Uh, first, a little overview about Prisma Health, and then we'll take a look back at the last year and, and where we are now in, in the Midlands. Prisma Health is a health system that came together two and a half years ago. It's 18 acute care and specialty hospitals. We have nearly 30,000 employees uh, and 270 physician practices. As South Carolina's largest employer, we're proud that we're literally within 45% of the entire state's population are within 15 uh, miles of us. We have about uh, 3,000 uh, beds licensed in the state. Uh, and about a third of those, a little more than a third across the Midlands here. And my usual home base is uh, right in Columbia at Richland, uh, but also Baptist Park Ridge and Toomey. Um, as you know, we've got two level one trauma centers here at Richland and up in Greenville uh, and a comprehensive stroke program. But we really pride ourselves on our academic affiliation with the University of South Carolina School of Medicine and train over uh, 600 residents and fellows. There are challenges in South Carolina, certainly. Uh, we are not the healthiest state, uh, not the fault of anybody on this call. Uh, probably it took a long time to get here, but Prisma really regards this as the good work that needs to be done and hopes that uh, we'll be able to make an impact. In each and every one of our meetings, our uh, CEO, Mark O'Hala and Angino uh, Sinopoli, our chief medical officer, remind us uh, that it's our job to change these statistics and to move our state into the top decile. It's our big opportunity if we can enhance clinical quality, enhance our patient experience, improve access to affordable health care, um, we can work together, uh, both physicians and patients, to make sure we have a healthy uh, operating bottom line because without that, we can't reinvest back in our communities. And I think you'll see and appreciate that's exactly what we do. Um, you know, the pandemic uh, started not a thousand years ago. It was in all of our recent memories, sadly. Um, but if you look back at the beginning, December 30th, 2019, there was a chat room post in China from uh, Dr. Li Wenliang to his classmates. He was an ophthalmologist and he raised a concern about a cluster of pneumonia cases that he saw in his hospital. They weren't his patients, but he, he was concerned that they looked an awful lot like a SARS-CoV infection, which almost two decades before had frightened the world greatly. Um, when he mentioned that just in a chat room, he was severely reprimanded by the Chinese government uh, and forced to retract his statement. 
Two weeks later, he contracted the disease himself from a patient he'd been treating who had glaucoma. On February 7th, five weeks after he sounded the alarm, he expired from the illness that he essentially uh, alerted the world to. And there were a lot of early missteps. You'll notice just a day later, the government of Wuhan, now outed, confirmed that there were several cases, maybe dozens, um, but the researchers were quick to assure the World Health Organization that although it was a new virus, there was no evidence of human to human spread. Um, we now know that to not be true uh, as cases uh, almost immediately began to climb in early January, the first recorded death on the 11th of January. But in looking back, the country of Taiwan had alerted the World Health Organization to a similar finding in mid-December because they're not allowed to be in the WHO uh, due to China's objection. Um, that news didn't get to the world. Uh, it was less than two weeks later, we had the first recorded case in Washington state. But at that time, there were already multiple cases across uh, Asia and Japan. China responded fairly quickly on the 23rd of January, just as millions planned to travel across China to celebrate their Lunar New Year. Beijing locked down uh, the city of Wuhan. Uh, 11 million people, a city the size of London, was locked down and major celebrations were canceled. Unfortunately, 5 million people had already left the city. Meanwhile, in the US, uh, we weren't really noticing that. We were busy as the House of Representatives prepared articles of impeachment. Um, but yet, uh, two weeks later, the government enacted its first travel ban against the objections of many, uh, saying that uh, we would have a soft travel ban on people coming back from China, allowing the nationals to return. It was at best a gesture uh, and unfortunately uh, not very effective. Um, just a, a couple weeks after that, researchers gave this new mystery disease a name. It was caused by a virus so similar to the disease caused by SARS-CoV. They named the virus SARS-CoV-2 and coronavirus disease was then christened the name of the disease it caused. COVID-19 is for coronavirus disease 2019. Shortly thereafter, the first European death was recorded in France. It began to surge across Italy. Iran became the second focus of the disease, second only to China, by the 24th of February, less than eight weeks after uh, the Chinese surfaced the problem. And the first death was believed to be at the end of February 20 uh, on 229. Uh, but actually, we knew later that there were deaths as early as the 6th of February. Now, people wonder, why is it called a coronavirus? It's because of the way it looks under the electron microscope. The spikes on the outer surface of the virus, the spike proteins, were felt to look like a crown of thorns, the Latin for crown, coronum, and so the term coronavirus. It's a big family of viruses that include things as simple as the common cold, and that's type 229E. So nothing too exotic about a virus, but what made it novel was that it, it found its first place in an animal population and then sprung uh, to the human population. And that's what made it so devastating. Nobody of the, of the 4 billion people walking around planet Earth had an immunity to the coronavirus because it was a novel virus. These are the images that we saw when we uh, looked at the Northeast in the spring of 2020. The CDC banned gatherings of 50 people for the next eight weeks, wasn't that optimistic. Uh, the president the next day said, no, he thought it should be 10 people. The European Union closed on St. Patrick's Day to 26 other countries, and suddenly we realized that our hospitals could be overrun. FEMA stood up a thousand bed hospital at the Javits Center in New York City with the goal to offload non-COVID patients from their hospitals, but almost immediately they began to see COVID patients as well. Uh, on 326, the United States now led the world with 81,000 cases and 1,000 deaths, and with great fanfare, the U.S. Naval Hospital Ship Comfort entered New York Harbor on the 30th of March uh, to take up its duties. New Jersey, my home state, was no stranger to this. The governor made a plea for medical volunteers to come, come from out of state, come out of retirement. He wanted all the help he could get. The tri-state hospitals were instructed to double their ICU capacity. Um, there were strict lockdowns on business travel and restaurants. And suddenly, New Jersey exploded to 4,300 plus cases a day. Uh, New York had over 10,000 cases a day. There was no doubt that if COVID disease had any part of the country in its grip, it was the Northeast United States. 
On April 30th, there were 113,000 cases already in New Jersey. At that time, South Carolina was averaging just 168 cases. This shows you the Atlantic City Convention Center, which we turned into a 500-bed COVID response hospital. That's our governor who uh, made a press, uh, press uh, appearance. Uh, that's me, uh, who was the chief medical officer called back to New Jersey uh, to help out. But COVID-19 would not neglect the South. As our cases began to skyrocket, everybody down here was taking notice about what could we possibly do to get ready and protect ourselves. Nobody knew if this was going to be a warm weather disease or if it was a cold weather issue like the flu. Uh, and as cases began to skyrocket up north, South Carolina began to see an early first wave that really in retrospect was almost more of a ripple. On the 20th of March, DHEC uh, noted that cases were now over 100 confirmed. Again, put that alongside New Jersey's 4,300 a day. South Carolina then uh, uh, issued a quarantine. They didn't want incoming travelers from hot spots. It was a prudent gesture uh, at the time, uh, just as other states were locking down people from entering, um, the ones not yet afflicted were looking for ways to keep the disease from entering. On the 3rd of April, South Carolina closed retail stores and said, we're not gonna have vacation rentals to people from New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Um, whether that was a public health decision or a political decision, it's hard to say, but needless to say, up and down the East Coast and across the country, politics and COVID began an unhappy marriage that was to nobody's benefit. Then South Carolina really enacted its first soft lockdown on April 6th, as cases peaked uh, at 190 per day just four days later, and that is sometimes referred to as the homework family lockdown, because the governor said, if it's not essential, there's no need to go do it. And I think uh, that may have helped uh, stem your tide early. Um, but I think everybody was uh, optimistic a little too soon. Cases did peak here at just 190 a day. And suddenly six days later, the call to reopen things that had been closed just two or three weeks before began. Public boat landings were reopened, quickly followed by the beaches and some retail stores. Counties and towns got autonomy to make these decisions. And that mandatory quarantine put in place against the Northeast was rescinded because after all, there's an awful lot of tourism that comes uh, from the East Coast uh, down to Myrtle Beach and Kiowa Island and, uh, and the South Carolina beaches. Um, still too cool up in New Jersey and New York for that. And so I'm sure people were eager to get out. Things continued to look good in South Carolina and cases reached a new low in mid-May. And tourist attractions were then announced to be open and ready for business which reminds me a little bit of the movie Jaws when the mayor opened uh, everything up uh, to tourism, but the shark was still in the water. Just one week later, beaches were packed up and down the coast of South Carolina and cases ominously began to rise again. Some of those people went back to their home states and eight showed up in West Virginia with a common thread of, we'd all been in Myrtle Beach. And so suddenly Myrtle Beach was branded as a, as a hotspot and source of another pandemic. The tri-state area in New York quickly retaliated and Chicago said, our, we're not gonna take any travelers to our cities from South Carolina. And then the July spike came when hospitalizations and cases began to hit new records. Now this shows you the case count across the United States and where things were. So back in May and June, things weren't too hot here in South Carolina, but they had felt to be a crisis in New York and New Jersey. By the time we got to June and July, those numbers began to climb, and that was really the first uh, peak here in South Carolina. And then you see what happened to us at Thanksgiving, followed by Christmas, and then the spike after New Year's, which created a January like we all hope we never see again in the uh, health uh, business. It was near catastrophic, and I would say the system bent, but luckily didn't break. At this point in the United States, over 30 million cases, and over half a million uh, deaths recorded to COVID-19. In South Carolina, when the world was on fire, things were nice and quiet here. Then you began to see that rise at the end of May until the seven day average in July came. When I arrived at Prisma in September, we thought the worst was over. And then we said, well, this must be the new normal uh, running from October to November until just before Thanksgiving when things ominously began to go up. So uh, we weren't immune from that. Uh, this is where the entire country looks right now. And so you see that early July peak, the Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's peak, and now we've come down and we all feel like we're out of the woods, but let's remember where we are. 
we're exactly where we were back at the beginning of July when we thought, oh my God, the world's on fire. So as, as good as we all feel about it not being as bad as it was, we're clearly not out of the woods yet. What I find interesting about this slide is that it also tells you where the other states are now. And so South Carolina is really in the middle of the pack. If anybody thinks that we didn't do a good, I, a good job as a state and as a health department and as healthcare providers, I'd say we're right in the middle of the pack, but we're actually better than many of the states that had a far tighter lockdown. Not to say that we had the right answer and they didn't, but right now today, New York, Michigan, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Delaware are all far worse off than we are in South Carolina. And in the two days or three days since this graph was created, things have continued to improve just a little bit here. We do have to keep an eye though on uh, the percent of tests that are still coming back positive. 4.1% of tests positive is still a bit of a, an eerie number. Uh, we've been down that low uh, before, uh, back in June and July, but we know what can happen because although we've got uh, you know, about a million, 1.2 million people partially vaccinated, uh, we know that there's another 4.4 uh, million people who aren't. So there's a lot of work still to be done, but a lot more vaccine is coming down the pike and a lot more places are dispensing it. And that's good news for everyone. So where are we now in looking at our own patients? Well, this is our numbers here in the Midlands uh, and across, uh, across uh, the entire Prisma footprint. At one point um, in July, when we thought the world was ending, we had 321, but then we found out that 546 was really uh, the, the peak for us. We hope to never get back there again. Prisma Health has treated now over 9,000 patients in the pandemic, fully 30% of those treated in South Carolina. Today, we're chunking along in that 100 to 85 range. Uh, each day, those seeing one or two more discharges than admissions, but every day still seeing admissions. We've also uh, stood up testing centers and have tested over 345,000 uh, patients across the state. Uh, thankfully, others have gotten into the test space because something everybody should remember is this is what a healthcare system does, but not so much what a hospital system is used to doing. We like to think that we are uh, here for you as population health providers as we change from a um, consequence-based system of management to being more proactive. But we took many of our staff and repurposed them from our offices uh, from our administrative offices, from inside our hospitals, and ask them to become uh, testers of, of people in drive-throughs, uh, vaccine administrators. These people uh, put in extra shifts, extra hours, and each, it seemed like each passing month, our ask got greater, and honestly, their answer uh, got even greater. And along with the, with the good people at Prisma came the thousands and thousands of partners from USC, from our medical school, from the National Guard, who really made much of this possible, uh, from our nursing schools. Um, people pitched in to help us open up vaccination centers uh, in multiple locations. The world also changed a great bit. So if you said to somebody, hey, do you want a virtual visit? They usually would give you an eye roll a year and a half ago. Uh, now we've had uh, over 600,000 virtual visits as many people were afraid to leave their homes during the height of the pandemic and our primary care and behavioral health team shifted to providing many, uh, many virtual visits. I think the great enabler of this uh, after COVID virus was finally uh, CMS proposing that there actually should be some kind of reimbursement uh, for providing a service through telemedicine that's provided in an in-person medicine, especially when telemedicine was safer for the patients at that time. Imagine going into your doctor's office with a sprained ankle and being surrounded by 20 coughing patients. If you didn't have COVID when you sprained your ankle, you would by the time you left the office. So being able to care for these people in a safe environment and avoid uh, clusters together, I think was pivotal to maintaining the health of the public through the crisis. I think though that um, some really great things happened in the world of science this past year, and we really should be somewhat in awe of the way industry, science, universities, governments work together to take down the usual competitive and capitalistic barriers and work together to help us find solutions in a much faster fashion than I don't think we've ever found across the history of medicine 
in the United States. And so I'll torture some of you a little bit who avoided your science classes, uh, preferring uh, other areas, accounting, political science, or engineering, and really uh, want to uh, give great credit where credit is due to the to the industry and partnership that happened with our universities to create some, some pretty incredible solutions. Medicine didn't get to go on offense until right before this last surge. And the first thing uh, that happened to the good was the recognition that we could create antibodies to COVID. We've been trying many things since the beginning of the crisis. We have some good antivirals that started to uh, lower hospital stays, but we didn't really have anything for that patient who just had a positive test, was starting to get sick, and was either going to get very sick or get better. And so the creation of monoclonal antibodies, which were actually fashioned in our labs to take on the COVID virus, became uh, pivotal in keeping people out of our hospitals. As the number of people in our hospitals continued to climb and the number of ventilators available continued to decline, having this as our first tool was critically important. And the mechanism by which a monoclonal antibody and your own immune system uh, create a defense against COVID are remarkably similar. You remember that spike protein that gave the coronavirus its name? Well, by being able to create antibodies in the lab that detect the spike protein and bind to it, we were able to keep the virus from binding to cells. A virus that can't bind to one of your cells can't do you any harm. Where it creates harm is it binds to the living cell, it injects its own DNA into it, and turns that cell into a factory to create more viruses by the millions. And so monoclonal antibodies enabled us to create a line of defense for those people who had early COVID disease by blocking the virus's ability to attack further. It didn't work every time, but you'll see in one study, it certainly gave the government enough reason to issue an emergency youth authorization, something they rarely did up to now when medicine and science indicated that the risk of allowing something to go forward for use was lower than the risk of not allowing it to go forward for use. And that was a giant step forward, both for government and for science, because it allowed us to deploy things years faster than we would have in the past. So how do creating antibodies um, compare to creating a vaccine? Well, the antibody is that protein that binds to the virus and a vaccine stimulates your body to create that same protein created in the lab. You would give an antibody to somebody that already had the virus, but a vaccine to somebody that didn't have it to train their immune system to create antibodies. An antibody in injected into you when you're in early stages of illness can work immediately. A vaccine will take several weeks and sometimes two doses to train your immune system to make those same similar antibodies. And then how long does the protection last? Well, an antibody will last as long as it's circulating in your system, but it hasn't trained your immune system to respond on its own. Vaccines will sometimes last years, sometimes decades sometimes only a year. And so we can't really say today if vaccination for COVID will be a yearly event or an every five-year event, or whether we'll need booster shots, which will allow us to take on those variants of the virus, which are certain to occur and occur naturally in history. The coronavirus isn't any smarter than any other virus. It's just a question of whether or not our immune system sees it as close enough to the last virus to be able to attack and stop it. So in your monoclonal antibody uh, cabinet right now, we have three that have been approved for emergency use. And you see in the graphic on the left, the concept of the antibody blocking those receptors, those spike proteins, which would normally um, bind to a receptor on the human cell. If we can take up that space with bulky antibodies, then that virus can never bind to your cell, can never inject its DNA, and can never turn your cell into its own factory. Now, we know this won't work for somebody that's already in the late stages of COVID. Unfortunately, if you're on a ventilator and your lungs are filled with viral producing disease, your body's immune system has been activated to fight it, but in a way that is not to your benefit, uh, unfortunately, this won't help. But we did learn that if we give it early in disease, it can make a real difference. And in this study of, uh, 
uh, over 8,400 patients treated, you can see that post-treatment hospitalizations were about three and a half percent. So some people still got sicker, but we expected it to be about five times that much, over 15%. The ability to make that difference, even though it wasn't 100%, estimated in this study group that they were able to avoid nearly a thousand hospital admissions. Well, I can tell you when your emergency room is filled with people, your ICUs don't have a single bed left, your floors have opened every single bed they had, and you're starting to count hallway space, being able to remove 970 out of a potential 8,400 patients from needing inpatient care is a really big deal. And we think that in that study, the number of deaths prevented was over 95. So you'll hear a lot about vaccines capability. This is what the monoclonals could do. Remember, our endpoint isn't necessarily to keep somebody from coming down with mild symptoms. That would be great if we could. But if a vaccine is able to keep you from getting so sick that you need a hospital or that you're permanently impaired or that you die, that vaccine should be judged a success. So how do vaccines work? Because you've heard a lot about the vaccines that are now on the market and available to us. And there are really three that are on the radar screen. Three have been approved, but there are three different mechanisms that these vaccines uh, were used to, a, to create an antibody to the virus. And three very different approaches, some of which are relatively new, all have been tried and true to some extent. Uh, the protein-based approach is the one that the company Novavax is now applying for an EUA from. And in that one, it just takes spike proteins that were made, injects the spike, spike protein into the individual. Your body sees that protein as foreign and generates an immune response to it that ultimately creates an antibody. Kind of novel, hasn't been rolled out yet, but has some very good early data. The nice thing about a spike protein well, it can't give you COVID, it can trigger your immune system. And so that's a, a passive way to, to get a response from your body to do what you need it to do. The J&J &J vaccine has uh, just been approved a few weeks ago. We have the first um, 40 or 50,000 doses have rolled into the state of South Carolina. Most of those are not available to health systems for a, a few good reasons. We can't wait until they're more widely available so that we can use them too. Think of the J&J &J vaccine as the one that is most likely to get into your doctor's office, is a one-time vaccination. Uh, but when it first came out, had the press of, well, gosh, it's only 73% effective. Um, and we know that the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are 94% effective. But listen closely. The endpoint of their study was symptomatic illness. If the endpoint of their study was hospitalization, severe disease, or death, they would have been 100% effective because not one person that had breakthrough disease in the J&J &J vaccine required hospitalization or intubation. So great vaccine, extremely safe, but its mechanism is different. In the J&J &J vaccine, we were able to code another virus to be a vector to take the recipe for that spike protein into a cell, the cell would make the spike protein, your body would see that protein and create an antibody to it. Using a virus as a vector is a sort of tried and true approach to vaccination. This virus is a harmless virus, it can't cause COVID, it's safe, people shouldn't worry about it. We've been making vaccines this way for a long time. I think the thing that's gotten the most public attention are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines because they use a very novel approach. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines create a messenger RNA. Now messenger RNA is that molecule that inside your own cells today is used as the messenger to your protein producing area of the cell to create a protein. And they were able to emulate the recipe for the spike protein, link it to a lipid, and by injecting it in your arm, it gets into your cells, and your cells then make that spike protein. It can't give you the COVID virus because it isn't the COVID virus. It is only the little tiny fragment of the COVID virus RNA that codes for the spike protein. So all three mechanisms need a spike protein to trigger your own immune system. But the kind of neat thing about the mRNA approach is it doesn't need to be cultured in eggs like influenza vaccine was. 
It can be formulated in the laboratory. If there is a mutation down the line where the spike protein changes, the same mechanism to produce today's mRNA vaccine could be modified. And when you hear people talking about a booster shot, that's what they're talking about, a slightly different second shot. The mRNA protein it codes for might be slightly different, but it might fit the new coronavirus variant a little bit better. So what about the mRNA vaccines that uh, people have been concerned about? Both Pfizer and Moderna utilize this mRNA vehicle. Both require second doses, Pfizer ideally on day 21, Moderna day 28, but we know now anywhere up to six weeks has been shown to be effective. The hard part about mRNA vaccines is they require ultra cold storage. So hospitals initially were the only ones that might have uh, refrigeration down to minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit, far colder than the freezer that's keeping your steaks cold at home. You can only store them at regular freezer temperatures for a few weeks, so they have a short shelf life. And once you thaw them out, those open vials only have a five-day shelf life. Each vial has five to six doses in it, and so we need to use those very quickly. They, came lo they are logistically almost impossible for a doctor's office to manage because even in our mass sites, we have teams of pharmacists taking the ice-cold frozen vials, reconstituting them with saline, drawing out of those vials and creating the shots that are going into people's arms. They are logistically difficult to manage. Uh, and that's what makes the J&J &J vaccine so attractive. It's a one dose. You can store it at regular refrigeration temperatures for weeks. The question comes up though, if that's a new technology, are they safe? Well, in an article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, literally just three weeks ago, um, they did a prospective study of 69 or 64,000 people getting the mRNA vaccinations. 4,000 of those people had a history of significant allergy. So they're people that you know, had a terrible problem with a bee sting or had a problem with the medication. They probably carried an EpiPen every day and they still were in the study. And so what happened in that study to 64,000 people? Because you'll hear many anecdotes about this person or that person. And when you vaccinate a million people, it's not surprising that somebody might die 30 days later. When you do a million, uh, a million of anything to a million people, it doesn't mean there was a cause and effect. I, I think about the fact that if we gave the same million people blue M&Ms, somebody would have a heart attack in the next 30 days and it wasn't from the M&M. But looking at this study, 25,000 vaccinations of Pfizer, 38,000 plus of Moderna, how often was there a severe reaction? less than 27 hundredths of a percent, 23 hundredths of a percent. And in those ones that said, oh, I'm, I don't feel good, I'm wheezing, I'm starting to get a rash, I'm getting hives. If we looked at just those people, only one required hospitalization, zero went into shock like you might see after a bee sting or a, or a peanut allergy, none ever required mechanical ventilation. So are these safe? Yeah, I think it's safe to say that they're safe. Everybody should approach these vaccines with confidence. No corners were cut. It's sad that they got caught up in the political maelstrom of an election leap year, where you had candidates saying, I'm never gonna take it until it's FDA approved. Well, you know what? To this day, it's not FDA approved. It's approved under an emergency use authorization. There's no live virus in them. Nobody had a severe reaction. They're really equal if you look back at the differences of, you know, 1.93 and 100,000 or 10,000 versus, you know, 2.2. It's, it's a minimal difference. When you look at it, the risk of taking the vaccination with all the fanfare around it is about the same as giving somebody an antibiotic for a sore throat. The severe reaction level is about comparable to having a simple prescribed antibiotic. Now, who shouldn't get the shot? It's, it's interesting. This is interpreted sometimes by the country you're in, <laughs> but really the only people currently recommended to not be offered the shot are people with a known history of allergy to polyethylene glycol or polysorbate. These are things that are sometimes used in vehicles for vaccines. So if you've had a reaction, a severe reaction to a vaccine that had polyethylene glycol or polysorbate in it, a cross-reactive ingredient, they're the only ones now currently recommended to maybe avoid the shot. 
What if I have an immune disorder? What if I have seasonal allergies? What if I can't eat peanuts? You should still get the shot. Remember, we now have 100 million people vaccinated in this country with at least one dose of vaccine. We should proceed with confidence and do our best to take down the barriers and fears that you hear people articulate. The numbers are here. So those who, who wish to embrace science, the science is on our side. Now you've heard a little bit about variants and certainly that's a concern. And it's a concern here in South Carolina where you heard about the South African variant uh, showing up uh, in our population. It's hard to get a handle on how many there are of these variants. And you know, fortunately public health departments will take a small number of all the vaccination positives and review them further. If you go for a COVID vaccine to the corner drugstore, they're not gonna test for the B.1. Uh, 0.351 South African variant, but a small subset of those will be tested. And then the state health departments make an estimation about how prevalent they are in the population. Well, it's no surprise as millions of people in South Carolina, probably over a million have already had COVID virus. Some may not have known it. 19% of people may never know they've already had the virus. It's not surprising the virus that's showing up are the ones that we didn't have a strong immunity to. So these are starting to show up. We're not really sure of the ramifications. Understand as we start to take a, a well-deserved sigh of relief here that across Europe now, uh, other countries are going into lockdowns. And so uh, we're not quite out of the woods yet. We have the UK variant now, which is the most common variant and seen much more commonly now in Florida. Uh, we're not too far from Florida, so uh, it's not gonna be surprising when we start to see that. Um, and what does it mean when they say the variant is um, more infectious? Well, you know, a coronavirus is far more infectious than the common cold or the flu, and you'll see that in a slide in a second. Um, but if something is more infectious and can hit many more people, then it's also going to seem uh, and be uh, more lethal because it will engage uh, more people with the disease. Uh, again, not like everybody with the UK variant dies and everybody with COVID virus, not so. Um, we know that both viruses are, are deadly, but it's a difference of if one is uh, one and a half percent, the other could be three. If one is two percent, the other could be four. Um, but this is, this is how we look at the data and how some of these strains are becoming more common. But if you look at the gr graph on the right, why is a more transmissible strain more worrisome? Well, because if it's more transmissible, the number of people that it ultimately affects goes up much quicker. If they're just equally deadly, but no more transmissible, then the curves aren't too different uh, from our standard uh, COVID virus. But when it's much more transmissible, then that factor really begins to uh, weigh heavily on us. So theoretically, if we have a strain that is much more tra transmissible, that is gonna be a worry. The good news about that worry is that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was tested in South Africa at a time when the South African variant was just beginning to be identified. Now, in that data, it was 63% effective at stopping symptomatic disease, but 100% effective at keeping people from dying. So if our goal is to save lives, understand these vaccines, while they may be imperfect against these variants, we do believe is giving significant cross protection and the data is showing that. And I expect these companies will be coming back with boosters and tweaks as the um, virus population changes uh, in, our, uh, in our own country. Now, I've been following this every week since COVID hit, and this is something that I find incredible. If there had been no COVID virus, your hospitals would have been vigorously trying to protect everyone against the flu. We know that seasonal flu causes 60,000 admissions at a minimum every year, and sometimes over 250,000 admissions. It can cause 60 to 100,000 deaths nationally each and every year when the flu hits. That's why you see so much emphasis around getting your annual flu vaccination. But what happened this year as we all wore masks and washed our hands and kept six feet apart? This is data from tests done where someone comes in with influenza-like illness, and we're not sure. Do they have the flu? Do they have COVID? Do they have a cold? And so there's a test now called a quad test, and it looks for all these things. 
So if you came in with influenza-like illness and we tested you for the in, for results, we found that 6.4% of those people actually had SARS-CoV-2. How many had influenza A or influenza B? Zero. So we know keeping a distance, wearing masks, washing your hands seems to be more than enough to protect you from transmitting flu across the population. But COVID still manages to break through. And in those tests, if we look over on, on the right side, using a respiratory viral panel of tests as recently as this week, SARS-CoV, 9.3% of those people in, in 43 tests were COVID positive. Adenovirus, another cause of the common cold, was zero. Rhinovirus and enterovirus, 4.7%. But flu was zero. So we've gone on counterattack. We've had monoclonal antibody clinics open here at Prisma since the 2nd of December. Uh, we have done uh, nearly 1,000 infusions of monoclonals uh, uh, right here at Richland uh, across the entire Prisma system, uh, close to 15, 1,800. Um, but now we are really uh, full bore on trying to provide immunity for the community. DHEC has a new allocation process and what was a very unsteady flow of, uh, of vaccine in the early going um, now is much more steady. We know in the Midlands we're going to get a minimum of seven to 8,000 doses to dispense and hopefully uh, even more as a health system. But we now have many others that have joined the fight. So it's common now to see CVS or Walgreens or Publix or uh, uh, Food Lion being able to provide vaccine too. It isn't just an expectation for the hospitals, uh, but everybody. Um, we've been given mostly the Pfizer vaccine here, but you can see in the new allocations, the Midlands is getting 29% of the allocation uh, and uh, across all distribution sites, 31,000 doses. Um, we're all to try and keep no more than 5% reserve. We had to keep some reserve so that people coming back for second shots could get the second shots, com shots complete the cycle, and then we wouldn't worry about them anymore. So the, uh, the vaccination supply has become a lot more steady. Um, the timeline across the state has changed wildly. We keep changing this slide every two weeks as uh, the governor and DHAC join up to say, all right, how much supply is coming down the pike? Who can we add to the group? When they start to see one group's numbers fall off at the vaccination sites, they know it's time to open the gate to let those who want it have access. We live in a free country. Not everybody's required to get it. We hope they do. Uh, but as the numbers started to fall off for the 55 and up uh, last week, we were asked to shift gears not go to phase 1C, but to proceed immediately to phase two on March 31st. So as of yesterday, we were allowed to start booking uh, appointments for all South Carolinians over the age of 16. For those of you listening, please get the word out. With this announcement, we, uh, we were able to get additional doses of vaccine, certainly for our sites. If you were given an appointment for May 15th from CVS, and want to get it sooner, we know we will have literally thousands of open appointments on tomorrow and through the end of next week. We can't see out more than about nine days from our supply chain, but we know that we just added to our vaccine website the ability to schedule um, literally thousands of more vaccinations Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We, we will be there. Uh, and so the demand felt like this in waves. Each time a new wave is added, this is uh, V-Day. Um, this is our V-Day. We look at it a little bit differently. Across the state, 1.2 million doses, uh, 675,000 have completed both doses. That means 35 or 30 percent of South Carolina has had at least one vaccine dose, but only 16 have really completed the whole cycle. So we know there's a lot more work to, to be done. We know that others will continue to join us in the vaccination fight. We welcome as many uh, locations to open as we can. Um, it, it, it's been uh, hard going early on being essentially the only folks out there. Um, but now we've got um, some J&J &J vaccine to complement uh, our early Pfizer vaccine. We've got some large vaccination sites, the Kmart uh, Center upstate and uh, in Lawrence, there's a site. Uh, we've got Gamecock Park here and Sumter Civic Center uh, fortunately, the city of Sumter uh, joined with us and Toomey Hospital to allow us to move our small hospital site out to a center that could do 500 to 1,000 a day. 
our Gamecock Park site can do up to three, 3,000 or 4,000 vaccinations a day. And finally, the vaccination supply is catching up with us. So we really are encouraging people to do that. It was with great pride uh, in early February that we were able to announce the 100,000th uh, vaccine distributed by Prisma. The governor joined us at Gamecock Park uh, for that moment. It was a, a great moment of partnership. Uh, the uh, South Carolina National Guard has been a superb partner, has been helping us from day one. And we can't thank uh, those folks enough because you know they were activated and left families and jobs uh, to join this fight. Uh, and um, we couldn't have done it without them or without USC stepping forward and saying, if you can do this work, we can help you. Uh, with, a, with a location, and that partnership continues. Um, many of you will see at the end of April, uh, it, we will phase out of Gamecock Park and into Colonial Life uh, Stadium. The challenges of an outdoor site during uh, tornado warnings are considerable for our 100 or so staff members that only have their cars and tents to protect them. Uh, they weathered the incredible cold. Uh, we are grateful that USC will allow us to give them air conditioning. Um, the best way to get a vaccination appointment uh, for all of us is to go to prismahealth.org backslash vaccine, uh, make a MyChart account, uh, look for first available and schedule your appointment. Uh, and if you live upstate, uh, certainly do it at, at the Kmart Center. If you're down here, see if we can get you an earlier appointment than one you might have had elsewhere. Um, certainly CVS won't mind if that frees up an appointment in May for them but it gets you the vaccine a month earlier. Um, I think that serves everybody well. We have now distributed over 300,000 of those 1.2 million doses, the largest vaccinator in South Carolina. We say that certainly with pride. Last week alone, over 19,000 doses. We know we have the capacity to do more. And as we get the vaccine, we will certainly step up to do that. But pass the word, appointments are available twice a week. We add appointments to the website as the supply materializes. We do not know until sometimes Monday what we're gonna get on Wednesday. And so we add those appointments and then, and then we follow on with how it looks toward the end of the week, adding more appointments on Friday for the following week. So just because you might've gone there yesterday and not seen any appointments, uh, doesn't mean that by tomorrow noon, there won't be many more. But I can tell you, we added thousands for next week, uh, just in the last two days. The My Appointment scheduling should be easy for folks. It's the same uh, sort of steps you have to go through when you go to the DHEC website or go to CVS. Um, the vaccine shortage is not a Prisma Health shortage. It's not a South Carolina shortage. It literally is a national shortage. And as nationally, people continue to add uh, uh, people to the roles. And every state's a little different. Uh, you'll see the, the um, supplies wax and wane a little bit, but we do think we're in a much better place uh, than the weeks not too long ago when the supply chain was interrupted by two named winter storms and the factories in Minnesota for Pfizer couldn't get it to us. We're trying it, to get out to community groups and churches and those that have been reluctant. We've had many town hall meetings where we try and get this same message out to them. It's safe, it's effective, you need it. Uh, certainly uh, many people are at high risk. If you remember that uh, demographic slide early on about how many of our patients are diabetic, how many citizens are in the, in the obese category, how many have chronic diseases. Those are the very people that COVID is the harshest to. So we wanna make sure we uh, get that out. Our latest addition is to add mobile vaccination units to our, uh, to our army. Uh, we've done several uh, things in the uh, Midlands already uh, at churches and schools. We'll be rolling this out even more so. Nothing's more efficient than a mass site, but sometimes getting to four or 500 people that don't have access to the internet, maybe don't have a car, maybe can't get all the way to Columbia uh, or to Greenville. Uh, sometimes this is the best way to get them all together uh, for that. And so um, if, they, if they can't navigate a website, we do have a phone number they can call. Uh, obviously this works for the few and not for the hundreds of thousands, uh, but we're there to try and solve the problem in any way we can. We've got a couple of these active already, but we're expecting delivery of two more in May, and we will take those principally out to our challenged communities and to some of our major employers whose uh, work is critically important to the food chain or supply chain. Um, we use a uh, health index that the CDC has given us to tell us where are our most vulnerable populations, where have people not been vaccinated, and so we do target those 
I know everybody would love to have the unit roll up, you know, to their site, um, but uh, healthy people who have cars and can get to the mass centers, it helps uh, those others if, um, if they are treated that way. We've tried to do our best to getting the communication out to the community. Uh, our, our marketing team has been extremely active. We've teamed up with the mayor here uh, in uh, Columbia to get the word out. Uh, we've been available to WIS for uh, press conferences and to town hall meetings. And we just need everybody to know uh, there's a long way to go in this fight. There's still a lot of virus in our communities and we need everybody to get, uh, to get the word out uh, that um, it's almost reached a new day. We finally have something to fight back with and uh, can't, we won't um, rest until we actually have herd immunity. I've already started to see across the country some health systems are beginning to mandate that. Remember the federal government has never mandated a vaccine but state governments and school systems certainly have. Uh, I don't know what direction they'll go with this one. I only know that the more teammates we were able to vaccinate, the fewer nurses we had out on, uh, on disability and the easier it was for us to staff our emergency rooms, ICUs and hospitals for you. So that day may be coming. It won't be a hospital decision. It'll be a government or an employer decision. Um, lastly, if, if Haven can bring this slide up, I would love to play for you what I thought was a great moment uh, for our site at Gamecock Park uh, when uh, the, the handshake was really completed. And uh, we were thrilled when Coach Beamer came out, acknowledged our team there, which was also your students, your professors. It's the only place on earth you could probably get your vaccination from an internationally known um, infectious disease specialist because our teams were out there, our USC professors were out there on Saturday morning. So if, uh, if you can run this, um, this hot link for us, I, I would be much appreciative. Do I need to stop sharing my screen for that? Yes, and then I will share mine. And then I'll be happy to take any questions, but I thought it was a great moment and uh, go Gamecocks tomorrow night. the drone rises, those cars in line. All the way down National Guard Boulevard. You can see the vaccination tent set up and onto Bluff Road. John Dickinson and I help with registration at the uh, COVID vaccine site and week one the Gamecocks are open up against Eastern Illinois. What is going on? My name is Nicole Bookstaver and I'm a pharmacist out here at Gamecock Park and on September 11th the Gamecocks are traveling to ECU. Hi my name is Tanya Parcell. I'm a nurse at Prisma. We're headed to Georgia on September 18th. I'm Timothy Buchanan from uh, Prisma Research and on September 25th we are home against Kentucky. Post-vaccine monitor, and we're playing Troy on October 2nd. I am Beth Fletcher. I am one of the vaccinators out here for the COVID-19 vaccine, and we are away, Tennessee, October the 9th. Hi, I'm Amy Kennedy, and I am overseeing Gamecock Park, the vaccine center, which is a partnership between Prisma Health, University of South Carolina, and the National Guard. And on October 16th, we are home against Vanderbilt. Hey, I'm Angela Brickley. I'm actually the director of Baptist and Parkridge Emergency Departments, but here I am over the monitor um, observation area for this wonderful COVID vaccine for the community. But on the 23rd of October, we will be away at Texas A&M. So please tune in and watch our Gamecocks win. And my name is Tyrell Gallman from Columbia, South Carolina. And October 30th is our bot week. I'm Laura Jane Straw, and I'm a pharmacist out at Gamecock Park, and on November 6th, we're taking on Florida at home. My name's Tim. I uh, run the Red Lot, make sure everything runs smooth here at the COVID Vaccine Clinic, 
and on November 13th, the Gamecocks head to Missouri to take on the Tigers. Hey, my name is Cassidy Kemp. I'm a student at the University of South Carolina here at the Vaccine Clinic, vaccinating our patients. And on November 20th, we are taking on Auburn at home. My name is John Hutt. I'm the director of the Gamecock Vaccination Drive-Up Site. And I'm here to tell you that on November 27th, the Gamecocks will be finishing up their season at home. So that'll be a phenomenal Thanksgiving weekend. Celebrate Thanksgiving on Thursday, the game on Saturday, and you can use these season tickets oh my that gosh. we're giving you to come out for that game, that last home game. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you really so much. Appreciate yeah, that that's problem. beyond good. That'll be okay. a big non uh, that'll be a big non-conference matchup. Okay. Will you be there for it? I I hope so if I'm here, yeah. Okay, well you better be here because you've got season tickets this upcoming season. Oh my gosh. Nice job. Are Thanks. you a season ticket holder? I'm not. Congratulations, you are uh, now. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate all you're doing. Hey, I'll definitely be there. Thank you. All right. Absolutely. Are you a season ticket holder? I'm not. You are, you are now. So, congratulations. Oh, so, thank, thank you. you. That would enjoy these season tickets. This is tickets. my last year. Perfect. Well, these are some are season tickets. Are you serious? Tickets. Wow. I've got my tailgate spot over there. Here's some season tickets for you. Sounds yeah, great. Thank you, it. sir. Yeah, thank you for everything. <laughs> see you in College Station, but if not, we'll see you when we come back to Columbia with these season tickets <gasps> we're presenting to you. For real? For real. Oh, my God. Woo! <laughs> 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 Thank you. All right, Haven, you still there? I'm still here. What a touching video. It's pretty amazing. I have to tell you, that was so uplifting for the team. You can't imagine. Well, we'll be happy to take any questions if anybody's got any from the chat box. Yep, and just a reminder, if you do have questions across the bottom of your screen, that chat icon, you can pull them up. Well, I hope they're all online scheduling their appointments if they haven't had their vaccination yet. So great question. Does that mean the vaccine only lasts for six months? Actually, no. We don't have any data to suggest that it only lasts for six months. The latest data I read, there seems to be a belief that the vaccine will last one to two years, knowing that we don't actually know the answer to that. So if you had a vaccination against the mumps when you were a child, you may still have some immunity today, but we don't know for sure how long this vaccine will last. It is possible that it will become an annual vaccination like the flu. But if we do it every year, then we'll have a, a rolling immunity, like many who have had flu shots for 20 years, much less likely to get an infection from an influenza variant because they've got so much cross antibody. The thing that does go away are monoclonals. So if you had a monoclonal infusion because you had early COVID, that's not expected to last. But when you have a vaccine, you actually train your immune system and some cells continue to circulate that can create that antibody response even down the line, sometimes years. We just don't know yet how long these vaccines will protect us, just as we don't know how quickly the virus might change. How long do you expect masks to be suggested? Well, it's, it's a funny question that you asked that because if you watched the news yesterday, you might have seen the president and vice president with four masks on between them. On another channel, the new director of the CDC was explaining that those who are around already vaccinated people probably don't need masks at all. So I suspect that somewhere between science and political theater will reach that answer. Um, right now though, uh, they would caution people if you are around vulnerable populations who may not have been vaccinated or who uh, are still working in the hospital. Our patients come in, um, our staff are still in full, uh, full mask and PPE. I would say that if you're in a small group of people and you know they've all been vaccinated, it's probably reasonable to maintain some distance, but take off your mask. 
Now, if there's somebody in that group that hasn't been vaccinated, I would take that back. Wow, well, that's a good question. Um, these were challenges. Uh, it was rewarding for me to be called back to New Jersey to help them stand up the COVID relief hospital. Uh, it was, uh, I would say, even more rewarding uh, to be part of the vaccination effort for Prisma uh, when we were desperately, you know, the vaccine arrived on December 15th at about 11 in the morning here at Richland. It came, uh, you know, by FedEx in an ultra cold container and dry ice, and it was no more than 150 minutes later, it was thawed out and we were starting to dispense it. Um, we then had the challenge of how do we put up a mass vaccination site? So we initially opened sites in all our hospitals and tried to take care of the first line providers, uh, the elderly, the most vulnerable. And we quickly realized um, when a hundred people are crowding the lobby of your hospital, it's hard to maintain social distancing and all the things that you've been recommending to others. And we knew we could service many more people at a mass site. Um, to be able to stand up Gamecock Park literally in two weeks time was incredible. And it brought together every facet of the organization from strategic planning to facilities, to emergency management, uh, to the IT team that had to put up a, a basically an IT web so that we could enter people into the government's website as we vaccinated them. Um, incredibly rewarding to do that, I have to say. and. Every time I go down and visit my team, I think, boy, you know, what great work. We pulled people out of our practices uh, down to help that, you know, came to work thinking they were going to be sitting in the orthopedic office today. And suddenly they were in 38 degree weather at Gamecock Park getting frost off their windshield. And they did it, you know, without hesitation. So I tell you, I think that's been rewarding. And I think uh, the spirit of everybody to respond. Um, it's probably not known to the public. Uh, under our uh, emergency declaration, the medical schools suspended classes. The residency programs suspended their lectures. Uh, the residents rolled in to help us. We were staffing units in our hospitals. At, I mean, picture a, a small rural hospital like Toomey with 50 or 60 COVID positive patients. Um, we were able to take care of those people only because everybody stepped up. And we'll be relieved when everybody has stepped back, found their swimming trunks, and looked for a good place to go this summer. That's that's what we're hoping for, like everybody else. We want to get everybody back to normal. Um, we'll be glad when we can give back, you know, colonial life next summer and say, okay, put on concerts now. Let's get back to normal. All right. Well, it looks like we got to all the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott, for your time and your presentation. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure that everyone on the call did as well. And thank you to Prisma Health for making this event possible and for all of the vaccine work. And thank you to everyone who joined tonight. Well, thank you much. Thank you for having us. And please get the word out. If you're, if you're scheduled four weeks from now somewhere else, and you want it sooner, and you should, I think we can help you out. Wonderful. Have a good evening, everyone. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it.